Hi there, it's Scott Nicholson. I'm an associate professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. Welcome to session number nine of the Gaming and Libraries course. Now, today I'm going to be talking about the concept of the gaming experience. Now, I've used this term a few times before, but I really want to explore today. I'm going to present a conceptual model that I've developed about the concept of the gaming experience. And we're going to be using this model throughout the rest of the class to talk about what's going on with games and libraries. So again, today I'm going to be doing a screencast and talking about the game experience. Now, what's important is that we talk about briefly the difference between games and the gaming experience. So for example, this is a game, Ticket to Ride. Um, it's a board game. You see it's got pieces and components and things like that. But this is not really a gaming experience. It's just a game. This is a gaming experience. As you see, what we've got are some people that are excited, some people that are unhappy, um, but this is the experience of the game. And you see, it's actually about a lot more than just the game itself. As you can see, it's about people interacting with each other and the social activity. Now, this is another game. This is a first-person shooter game where people are running around with guns trying to shoot each other up. And, and so, again, you're immersed in this particular game because your avatar is you as you're seeing yourself out of your eyes in this first-person experience. But this is a gaming experience. This is the same type of game, a first-person shooter game, but it's done in a very different environment. And so, <clears throat> here you have people that are working together on a team, you've got cool lighting, you've got people in the back that are watching, you've got a whole gaming experience that's going on. This is Wii Bowling. So Wii Bowling, as you see, again, we've got a game, and it's a video game, but this is not the gaming experience. But this is. This is the gaming experience. We've got people that are engaged with the Wii and excited and, and watching, and you've got people who are watching, spectators, as well as people who are playing. This is also the gaming experience of Wii Bowling. As you can see, Wii Bowling is very popular with seniors as well as kids, and they can actually play together as well. You know, there's an interesting image that I've seen of uh, two teams of seniors playing Wii Bowling, all in matching league shirts, sitting in lines around the Wii. Now, there's no reason they need to have league shirts, and there's no reason they need to sit in little rows and things like that. But it's all about reliving an experience that at one point was really important to them. And that's the idea, is we're facilitating a gaming experience. So when you think about having a game go on in your library, I want you to think about yourself as facilitating a gaming experience. Now, what all goes into the gaming experience? That's what we're going to look at today. The first thing that are important are the players. So these are the people for whom you're putting the game on. These are the folks coming together to play the game. They're agreeing to, dis to suspend reality for a while and agree to play by a common set of rules and uh, have an interaction with each other as dictated by this outside set of rules until they reach an end condition and someone wins. And that's typically what's going on in the game. Now, all of these people come to the gaming table with some sort of external knowledge. There's stuff they know about the world. Some games tap that external knowledge and other games don't. But you have to recognize that each person, when they sit down to play, is more than just them. They have external knowledge. Now, they also are going to have some game knowledge. They're going to know about other games or perhaps the game they're playing or perhaps they won't at all. So if you have two people playing chess and one person has a lot of chess knowledge and the other person doesn't have any chess knowledge, well, one person's going to have an advantage in the game experience because of that previous knowledge. Now, the, when you prepare to play a game, you're agreeing to play within a game world. So the game world is going to be the background, the backstory of who you are, the idea of what's going on. And most games have some kind of a game world. Even something like chess may say it's very abstract, but there's still a game world. You've got all of these playing pieces. You've got this powerful queen, this fairly weak king, but he holds the key to everything. You've got pawns that don't do much but are willing to put their lives down, but sometimes can actually hop over here. <laughs> And so you've got this game world that you're agreeing to play in. Now, some games like Dance Dance Revolution have a very thin world. You're going to be a dancing star. That's it. Now, there are some games that don't have any world at all. They're a purely abstract game. And there are some games which the world is a really important part, like in many role-playing games. And so the game world is what the players are agreeing to, uh, to step into. 
Now, players interact with each other through manipulating something we call the game state. Now, the game state is the way that we visualize the game. So, for example, in a board game, it's when you see the board, you see all the pieces, that's the game state. And I interact with you, if we're playing chess, by moving a piece by changing the game state. Then you interact with me by moving a piece and changing the game state. And that's how we interact back and forth, by manipulating the game state. In a video game, you have the game state and 24 frames per second are changing. And so that is making the game state change. Now in chess, each move of a piece is significant. It's a huge change in the game state as compared to a video game where when you go from frame one to frame two, there isn't a big difference in the game state. But there's so many game states shown that when you make changes over time, the time element comes into play and you can make a big shift within the game state, but it's gonna take a number of frames to do that. Different ga games have different ways of representing the game state. Now, in a mental game or a social game, something like charades, for example, charades doesn't really have a f another game state other than the players that are involved with it. If you were to pause a game of charades, well, your game state is the players and, and the shape that they're in. You also might have a score sheet where you're recording what's going on. But this concept of manipulating the game state is going to be important as a form of interaction of players within a game. Now, there are other forms of interaction that go on within a game. Some games facilitate direct interaction with each other outside of manipulating the game state. For example, there's a game called Diplomacy. And in Diplomacy, what you do, it's a large map and you're representing a country in the world and you're trying to take over territories. It's a very simple game. Each turn, you go and write an order for each of your armies as to where they're going to move on the map. But you take about 10 or 15 minutes between every turn of the game and you all go talk to each other. And that's interaction that's going on that's not about manipulating the game state, but it's direct interaction with another player. In a game like Settlers of Catan, for example, where you're trading with each other, again, that's interaction that you're having with other players, it doesn't have to do with changing the game state. Now, if we agree to a trade and we trade cards, now we've changed the game state. Board games and face-to-face -face games tend to have more opportunities for that type of interaction than electronic games. But many electronic games now are enabling that interaction through voice chat, through online chat, things like that. So in Xbox, for example, you can play a team game of Halo where you can communicate with your teammates about what's going on and then change the game state accordingly. There's another form of interaction as well, and those are interactions that are not related to either changing the game state or interacting with other players about what's going on. And these are external social interactions. And these are things like chatting about, hey, what other games have you played that you liked? Or do you want to go out to dinner after this? Or hey, what'd you think of that movie? Um, and so when you have the ability to have interactions, then you can have other sorts of interactions too. But all of that comes into play in this larger game experience. You're looking to facilitate these interactions. Not only interactions about the game, but interactions that are beyond that. So people get to know each other. This is where the social component comes in. There are other people that are involved in the library game experience too, and they're spectators. So spectators are people who are in the same space where the games are going on, but do not um, play a game actively. Now, these may be players who are not currently playing a game. So I play a game, I'm done, then I become a spectator for a while, then I step back into the role of playing in a game. And so the spectators, or they may be a parent or friend who have no intention of playing, but they're there to spectate the entire time. So you have spectators. Now, the spectators may get engaged with the gaming experience in a couple ways. One, their presence changes what's going on in the game. If you're playing bridge at your house and it's just the four of you playing bridge, well, you don't have any spectators. Well, actually, technically you do, but that's a long story. But anyway, um, you may have, if you, let's say your kids come home and they're watching what's going on. Well, the fact that they're standing in the room watching what's going on is changing the way you are experiencing the game. So having spectators there does change the game experience. But they also can have interactions with each other. And that's one of the things you're going to hope is that the spectators will have interactions, will chat, uh, chat about what's going on with the game or chat about other things in their lives. So that's part of making this community hub. Now, it could be that the spectators get engaged with the players. They could do this a number of ways. One would be a social engagement. Hey, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while or something like that. It could be questions about the game. Hey, can you tell me how this game is played? Or it could be that the spectator is getting engaged in the game by telling a player what to do. Hey, did you see that? You should really do that. Or I don't think that's a good idea. 
that can really upset other players of the game. And especially if you're doing a game tournament where there is something that matters on winning, um, as the librarian, you may have to stop spectators from interacting with players about game issues. Usually limited amounts of social interaction is acceptable between players and spectators as long as it's not interrupting the game. But that's something as a facilitator of an experience you have to watch. You have to make sure that spectators are not ruining the game experience for some of the players who are involved. So that brings me to one other role in the gaming experience in the library, and that's library staff and library resources. They are in this space. Now ideally, they're going to be interacting with the spectators. They're going to be talking with folks about what sort of games they might want to play, about other library materials that might be on the topic, um, finding out why they're there that day, and helping the spectators to find games to play. Uh, ideally, the library staff will not be interacting too much with the players unless it's needed. Uh, the library staff gets the game going, they let the players engage in the game, and then afterwards is when they can say. They shouldn't be shoving books in their face when they're playing the game saying, hey, check this out. Um, but afterwards they can chat with them about materials that might be related to what was going on in the game or not. It's, you've got to decide what sort of experience you're going to facilitate. Now it may be for a game that requires multiple players that the librarian or the library staff finds themselves needing to play in the game. And again, if they're doing that, they should really see themselves as a facilitator of a game experience, not someone that says, all right, I'm going to show these kids and beat them at Blocus. Instead, what you should do is play the game but facilitate a game experience. So all of this stuff makes up the gaming experience. It's the players, the spectators, and the libraries, and the librarians, and the library stuff. There are interactions between the players about changing the game state, about interacting with each other about the game, or interacting with each other outside the game. The spectators interacting with each other and with the library staff, and interactions between the library staff and spectators and the players, but that should be kept at a minimum. So this is the model for the game experience. Now, in next episode, I'm actually going to take apart this model, and we're going to use this model and five parts of the model to develop five types of game experiences in libraries. I'm going to be presenting five archetypes, and it's these five types that we're going to use to uh, talk about of the wide spectrum of games for the majority of this course. So this model, we're going to move forward with this model next time and explore some of the specific areas of it a little bit more in depth. But I think that's enough for now, so I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.